Hey guys, welcome, welcome back to my channel. My name is Mike. You guys are welcome with me and Mike's Intellectual Corner. On today's episode, we are diving into a new series. This is um, Korea Admiral Yi, Keep Beating the Drum, Extra History. This is part one. Without further ado, we're just going to dive right into it. The year is 1572, 26 years earlier. A 28-year-old man rides across an open plain. A group of military men stand quietly, observing. His horse stumbles. He's thrown. At first, everybody watching thinks he's dead. His leg is horribly bent, broken. But after a moment, he gets up, dragging one leg behind him, and pulls himself to a willow tree. He binds his leg with its branches, remounts his horse, and finishes the military examination. He fails the exam anyway, but four years later he'll be back. He'll pass, and so will begin the career of one of the most glorious admirals of all time. It's strange that- Well, I think that he should have passed just on, the, on his, uh, his heart alone, because that's half of the- If you're ever in the military, that's like half of what anybody will ever tell you anyway. If you just have to have the heart and the courage to do something, and you know, you pretty much go for in your career. That's pretty much what he just showed, so. This man even decided to join the military. Korea had known 200 years of relative peace, threatened only by the occasional raids from the Jurchen tribes on the northern border and pirate crews plying the nearby sea. The military was not a highly respected career choice for a man of noble birth. Taking the civil service exams and joining the ranks of the Confucian court was a much better way to achieve power and success. And yet this man, Yi Sun-shin, though he was schooled in the Confucian texts, had dreamed of being a soldier since he was a little boy. And so at last, when he had passed the military exam, he was appointed to a desolate fort along the northern border. While most of the border forts were pits of corruption, seen simply as a place to dump individuals who had fallen out of favor with the court, Yi drilled his men rigorously and refortified his post, bringing it up to true readiness in case of an attack. One day, the provincial governor came by to inspect the post. This was a man all of the fort commanders dreaded, known for his harsh punishments and brutal discipline. But when he came to Yi, he simply said, Hmm, well done, and moved on. Shortly thereafter, Yi was moved back to Seoul, a sign of growing favor, and he was given a post at the I think you would have thought that if, if uh, he would have did that every single time, there would have been such a huge problem of corruption, you know what I'm saying, for it to get like that, but I, I guess uh, it kind of sucks, but let's see though. Let's keep going. Military academy there, training new recruits. He was by all accounts rigorous, diligent, and incorruptible. And this was exactly the problem. At this time, the military academy was actually a tool for younger noble sons to jump up the ranks quickly, and for courtiers to channel their favorite people into the cushiest assignments. And Yi was not cooperating. So, after a short stay in Seoul, he was booted back to a provincial assignment. By July, though, he had secured a position running a naval garrison, and was rapidly rising up the ranks again. But here, too, he was schemed against by corrupt officials. Many attempts were made to have Yi removed, but each one he parried expertly until, one day, one of his previous superiors from the military academy, one who Yi had rebuked for corruption, was called to his province to do an inspection. Seeing an opportunity for revenge, the inspector wrote a report castigating Yi, saying he was completely negligent. When the report got to Seoul, Yi found himself dismissed from the military entirely. Four months later, though, he was vindicated. Found innocent of the charges against him, he was returned to service, but demoted to the lowest possible officer grade. He might have languished at this menial post, but at last his diligence was finally rewarded when he was brought back to meaningful... Well, I mean, either, even so, it's still an officer position, so... I mean, the lowest officer position is still, like, the highest uh, enlisted position, if you, you know what I'm saying? So, I'm sure he wasn't sweeping or anything like that. He was probably just chilling probably just doing like some menial work still but not any, any not any labor type of thing i'm sure this menial post but at last his diligence was finally rewarded when he was brought back to meaningful duty by none other than one of his former rivals one of the fleet commanders who Yi had served under while maintaining the naval garrison had been transferred to the northern frontier and knowing that he'd need good capable officers he requested Yi be sent with him 
Soon, though, it became clear that Yi was needed to garrison a fort on the Tumen River, which was one of the demarcation lines between Jurchen and Korean territory. Jurchen raiders roamed far south of the Korean border, looting and pillaging at will. Raids had nearly overrun the nearby frontier province. And so, Yi took up the post. He drilled his troops until they were in top shape, and knowing that simply shoring up the defenses wouldn't be enough, he laid his troops out for an ambush, and then lured the raiders into... Yeah, see, this is why I'm more surprised that they even had... You know what I'm saying? They were talking about that it was so rare that people were joining the military anyway, because, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, they had a whole bunch of people... They had, like, their northern border, like he just said, had... Um, you know what I'm saying? Obviously, the, uh, like, the Gop Church, you had the the Mongols, you had, the, you know, all these different, the what you call it, like they have all these different nomadic tribes were up north, and then a little bit down south, you had China, and all these different uh, provinces that would always break break off, that was in the north, you know, and stuff like that, so it's like, I would figure you kind of need it, and then obviously, Japan hasn't started, uh, you know what I'm saying, doing this thing yet, but, you know, a little bit, Japan's going to start doing this thing too, it's, you know, pretty important, definitely to have, at least have a defensive uh, force anyway, you know. Korean territory. He fell on them with a ferocity and a swiftness they had never seen in Korea. Within hours, the tribes were smashed and their power shattered. They would never again be such a threat to the province. But here too, Yi was stymied by a jealous superior, and while the court was jubilant about his success, the official record reads, Although the court recognized Yi Sun-shin's meritous service to the king, it nevertheless decided against awarding him a prize. Shortly after this, Yi's father died, and being deeply rooted in Confucian ideals, Yi retired home for three years in accordance with the traditional mourning period. When he at last returned to service, he was put in charge of transportation for the court, but a mere 16 days later, it was decided that Yi was needed too badly at the border, and once again, he was sent north. He was to man a small island fortress. Undermanned, crumbling, beyond disrepair, he once again drilled its garrison, shored up its defenses, and week after week sent out a request to the district commander for reinforcements. Then, one morning, as the mists rolled in and most of the men were out harvesting rice, because the military was in such a state that men on the border had to harvest their own food... Well, you know what, at that point, it's kind of good to have uh, farmer peasants and stuff like that on your team, because at least they know how to um, farm you know, some good food at least for you to eat. Because I know if I was up to me, I wouldn't know what to do. Mists rolled in and most of the men were out harvesting rice because the military was in such a state that men on the border had to harvest their own food. The Jurchen attacked, pouring out of the mist on horseback. Yi Sun Shin only had a dozen men to defend with. He and his handful of soldiers fought desperately, cutting their way to one group of captives and escaping with 50 people the Jurchen would have taken prisoner. But by this time, you know the story. In order to avoid blame, Yi's superior, a man named Yi Il, blamed the entire defeat on Yi Sun Shin. He had him brought back to the capital, tortured, and put on trial in an attempt to have him condemned so that Yi Il could avoid any of the blame. But Yi Sun Shin did not crack under torture, and when it came time to take the stand, he said this to Yi Il. My lord, you are asking me to assume the whole responsibility for the misfortune, but you are wrong. May I remind you that you have always refused my frequent request for reinforcement. The defeat was not a result of my negligence of duty, but in large part, your fault. Therefore, it is not I, but you, who should be held responsible for the defeat. The court was stunned. Many of them knew of Yi's record and were inclined to believe him, so in the end, he was allowed to live. But he was stripped of his rank, again, and returned to the army as a common... Yeah, see, now I would expect him to do a lot of manual labor and stuff like that, because I'm pretty sure that he pretty much started as the equivalent of a, uh, P or a um, private, like straight up private, no rank whatsoever, just there. So, yeah, that definitely sucks. Especially somebody who's an, an officer, you know what I'm saying? Like, to go from an, uh, I'm sure he was probably, went, probably the equivalent of um, a captain or maybe a major, and to go from that to a, a private and to still want to be in the military is pretty, pretty abnormal, you know what I'm saying, but. ...listed man, starting over at the very bottom, as if he'd never taken the military examinations. He was once again placed on the northern border and asked to fight the invading tribes, and once again he did so with distinction, until finally in 1588 he asked that he be allowed to retire. But storm clouds were gathering over Korea, and some, especially his longtime friend, a man named Ryu Sung Young, recognized that soon the country would have need of good military men. While Yi had struggled through his career in the military, Ryu, his childhood compatriot, who had been his companion in games of war, had risen to be prime minister of Korea. 
It was actually through Ryu's influence, and because of his subtle aid, that Yi had time and again survived the machinations held against him. Now, Ryu planned to see that Yi would take his rightful place for the war he feared was coming. On the next episode of Extra History, remember how in the Sengoku Jidai episodes we talked about that messy Japanese invasion of Korea? Well, that's about to happen. Join us as Yi and Ryu take on the Japanese forces, as we delve into the differences in government, technology, and arms between these two nations, and as we explore the first few disastrous weeks of this war. Alright guys, so yeah, definitely a great um, start to a, a great series, a new series, and a great new uh, channel to to add to the um, to our history channel to what channels to learn from. Anyway, uh, thank you guys again for joining me on another episode of Mike's Intellectual Corner. If you guys like it, the, uh, like the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Don't forget to check out um, Extra History if you guys want extra content from them. I'll see you guys when I see you. I'm out. Peace.